Hi, this is Mark Patterson, University Ombuds for Cal State University, Channel Island. And this is the video interviewer series, Channel Our Potential, where I ask the question, what does it mean to you to channel our potential at CSU Channel Island? My guest today is Dr. Ernesto Guerrero, Director of Advising in the Division of Student Affairs. Dr. Guerrero is a three-time graduate of UCLA, his bachelor's, a master's, and a doctor of education all received there. He also began his professional career in student advising at UCLA. He moved to Cal State Channel Islands about five and a half years ago, and he's a self-described education nerd. With that, we'll go to Dr. Guerrero. Dr. Guerrero, it is great to, to finally get down and a uh, chance to talk to you here. What got you interested in this role as sort of a, a cross-divisional, cross-population connector? If you're going to get maybe able to make systemic change, it can't just be in your own little neighborhood. It's got to be across the university, across another division um, to be able to, to, to enact, you know, further reaching uh, changes or, or reforms. It informs my practice knowing what's happening in other divisions and other areas. It makes, makes what I can do for students better. And I hope that it helps other areas knowing what we do, it, it helps them make their services better as well. So I think there's a couple, couple layers there. You also have, I think, uh, some unique perspective on equity and inclusion issues. Tell us a little bit about you know, how that interfaces with your, your desire to, to use cross-divisional knowledge or cross-organizational knowledge. You know, my parents didn't go beyond middle school, you know, in Mexico, in a different country. So going to college for me as an undergrad, um, as much as they supported me morally and, you know, you know, to the extent that they could financially, um, they, they couldn't really impart any kind of, of the same social and cultural capital that, 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 that comes from having family members who have gone through that experience previously. So everything that I that I do, I think, is informed by by that perspective. Since that is the majority of our students here, our first generation college students, um, you know, I'm I'm trying to work towards making the university ready for them. You know, and this goes back to the, the literature in, in retention and higher education tends to focus on previously tended to focus on how do we make the student college ready, and for me, it's kind of like well, why don't why is the onus on the student rather than on the university? Why shouldn't we be more ready for the students that are coming to us as opposed to putting the onus on the student? So um, I think when I'm looking at different policies and different programming, um, that's the lens through which I'm viewing those. I like how you're using those connections, not just to, you know, out of generosity, but to inform your own practice. Are there any examples that uh, you can think of or to share that would kind of exemplify this, uh, this kind of dual mentality? Sure. So this this one uh, is from a, a couple of years ago. So we had a first year student who finished their semester. Uh, her father had a workplace injury, uh, so he he couldn't work. So she needed to stay home and help out with the family and help work and you know her sibling take care of her siblings and so on. So she did that. So she stayed out of spring semester, and then the following fall. At the time, students could take one semester off. No problem. They didn't need to notify anybody, fill out any paperwork. They were still in the system. But once it was two semesters or more, then they were out of the system, so to speak. And what that meant was that when they wanted to come back, whenever they did want to come back, they actually had to reapply to the university. And by reapply, I mean actually be considered a brand new student and go through the application cycle. And so we had to inform her, unfortunately, that well, you actually have to go through the admissions process. And not only that, but because you, you're not coming in as a transfer student, you have to go to community college, accumulate 60 units, and then apply as a transfer. So that really prompted me to think like, well, why do we, why do we require students to do that? If she had known that a leave of absence existed, uh, had, had had the college and uh, social and cultural capital to know to ask for that, uh, she could have filled out a one-page form, done a leave of absence, and would have been able to come back uh, I think within five years was, was the time frame, um, and come back no problem. So my thinking was, well, why can't we make this process simpler for students? You know, and so this was uh, my first couple of years here, and it required a lot of a lot of discussions, a lot of talking to different folks in different offices in the registrar's and admissions office. And my my kind of response was, well, they're a new student because we're saying they're a new student. You know, <laughs> we're defining them as a new student. What if we didn't define them as a new student? 
So long story short, uh, we were able to change this process. So we've now made it easier for students to come back and we, and we market this too. Like when a student does take some time off, we do campaigns and reach out to them. Hey, just so you know, it's easy to come back. Here's the process. Let us know when you're ready so that we have that lifeline out there for them. So you really were engaging them to perspective taking and helping others because I imagine folks have processes that they're comfortable with and familiar with and serve many useful purposes. Um, how did you go about, say, with faculty, getting that kind of perspective, not that they're coming at it from a hostile point of view, but just seeing it from a little different perspective? I think I start out by asking questions, by asking, you know, like, one, did, did, did you, have you ever encountered a student who had to come back, you know? Uh, and, and if so, you know, what, what was your experience with them? And then asking, well, did you know that, you know, this is the, the process? And by and large, the faculty that I, that I had talked to about this, they didn't really realize the, the intricacy of, of how much that was a barrier to students, you know? So I think just, it's, it's, and it's not through any fault of the faculty. I mean, they're, they're doing what they do. They're, you know, engrossed in their classes. Uh, they're, they're relying on folks like me and, and my colleagues to handle the, the, the you know, the step-by-step -step process for these students, right? So I was able to get some buy-in from faculty there. In terms of other offices, Again, asking questions. I, I don't start off by assuming that we must change everything. I want to understand why a particular policy or, or, or a procedure is in place because I'm I'm sure that at some point there was some reason for that to be the to be the the, the policy, right? So um, I want to understand what what the logic is behind that because it could be that that I don't have all the information. It could be that I'm missing a, a key component there that that it would explain why something is the case. Um, but could, it could also be that the circumstances under which that policy or, or procedure was created have changed. Uh, it could be that the individuals who established that procedure policy are no longer with the university, and maybe there's there's a, an openness to to a different approach. You know, so I think that that's how it came about that. And and lastly, I think it was presenting the real the real life consequences of, of a policy or procedure. It's easy to get caught up in, in a you know, more arcane uh, discussion of, of, of a policy in, in theory, but putting a face and, and, and a story behind it, you know, I think made the difference. I think once I, I talked to folks about it, I said, I'm gonna give you a concrete example and talking about her and talking about how discouraged she was when she was trying to come back and how there's, probably many other students that we never know of, who never even thought to come to advising to ask about that, who might be in a similar position. Um, and I think that that kind of brought it home. And so that, I think all those things combined uh, created a, a, an opening, an opening to say like, well, okay, all right, so how would you do it then? And that's all I needed. Like, okay, give me a chance to kind of <laughs> wed, get that wedge in there, you know, it's like, all right, well, here you go, you know? And and yeah, so it's I think it's it's listening, it's um, understanding the landscape, understanding why something was that way, uh, and, and then finding those, those, those gaps and those opportunities to, to, to put in there any perspective. I like the image of building the bridge, starting with curiosity and bringing it the rest of the way across with stories, with examples, not, of, not the theory doesn't have its place, but the power of connection comes through those things, curiosity and stories. I, I really don't think there's anybody on campus who's actively trying to, you know, to, to foil, you know, students, you know, uh, perspectives, you know, there's no, no, no villains in, uh, on this campus in, in that regard. I think there's just, there's varying degrees of, of either understanding the student perspective or of having a perspective beyond what's been the normal practice at CI, you know, and, and kind of thinking like, you don't know what you don't know, right? So thinking about what might be possible and trying to expand that perspective from a place of, of uh, not of antagonism, but of a kind of, of saying, I understand where you're coming from, but have you thought about this? You know, I think that that gets you most of the way there. Yeah, that is, I found so powerful as people feeling like you understand, not necessarily that you agree, but that mm -hmm. you're interested in understanding. That's such a powerful tool. Is there anything that you're involved with or working now that also might be some examples? I'm part of a, of a group that includes faculty 
that we're, we've been tasked with uh, examining the structure of the academic Senate. And we're the only CSU that is not a representative Senate. That was our task to kind of come up with, with, with a, a proposal or a potential model for that. Uh, and, and one of those were, were with, while you're at it, let's now kind of bake into it um, some equity uh, uh, you know, in, in there. Let me put you on the spot, uh, Ernesto. So imagine I'm a faculty member who is skeptical, who's saying, hey, look, Guerrero, stay in your lane. Um, this is just further erosion of, of our prerogative and role as establishing an academic institution and you know, the academic portions of it. Um, you know, what are you doing here? How do you how do you respond to that kind of uh, if you if you had that kind of approach? Sure, I I think my, my first question would be in what ways do you feel that that the that the role of faculty either has been eroded up until now, and in what concrete ways do you feel that the the the, the faculty role is eroded here in in this particular instance, right? And I would imagine that the response would be, well, you know, you're you're taking away votes from from faculty. Um, and you're giving some votes to folks who are not specifically faculty. And my response there would be that, you know, proportionally, your discipline and your subject area will be as represented as it is in the whole because we're using the we're using proportionality. And what we want is to have the folks who are involved in Senate to be actively engaged and whose peers agree that they are the most actively engaged. And not only that, but we've actually written in um, a process by which a senator could potentially be removed um, for not just not not doing their work. I like how you modeled. We didn't really go into it because I'm not a real faculty member, but started with the questions. Start. I mean, and almost instinctively, you, you went to, I want to ask these questions, and then you were talking about you're actually looking to enhance the voices of those who are engaged in the subject matter and hold accountability. I think that's a powerful model as well. And sometimes it seems like when we're talking about building bridges and connecting that we, it's all like kumbaya, but in fact, you're saying, no, sometimes there's some hard work and accountability that comes with those, you know, with that engagement. What about folks who may not have that kind of role? What advice would you give on being that connector when possible? First, don't don't limit your your sphere of influence based on what your position is. L let let other people limit you. Don't limit yourself. <laughs> you, you know, let your daily work inform what you want to do, right? Because and then that's the way the role that I've taken. Like with the um, with the the readmission policy, you know, I started building bridges with people. I started talking to faculty. I started talking to other administrators, talking to other staff and other offices. Because it could be that maybe I'm the one that's coming in from a different perspective and everyone's kind of like, well, no, this, this is in place because of X, Y, and Z. So I think in whatever role you are, then work within that and start building bridges with other people to talk about, well, maybe there's something we can talk about here, you know? So I think it's a matter of just not, not staying in your lane, you know? <laughs> your lane is the university. Your lane is, is the success of students, right? And I think that can apply anywhere. You could be seeing something that's not right. If you just stay in your lane, that's then what creates those silos. I like that idea again of uh, questioning. Well, my concluding question, which I think you may have already answered, but maybe you can even summarize more is, what does it mean to you, Dr. Guerrero, to channel our potential at CSU Channel Islands? I think what it means is channel beyond what you think your role is here. And that's what I've been trying to do really recently is just think outside the box. Like what are the craziest ideas you thought? Like what, if money wasn't an issue and if you could pass it, pass this through the Senate or whatever, what would you do? How can we challenge channel what your ideas are and our own innate kind of curiosity and asking questions and our own innate desire to make this a better place? Especially when you are, you feel that you've hit a brick wall 17 times in the last, you know, <laughs> two days. Um, that's, especially when you got to kind of dig deep and go back to that well of, of curiosity. What if we did this? Or why don't we do this? You know, or why is it that we, that we do this? I keep, I keep asking those, those questions. You just got to kind of channel your own, your own internal potential and the potential of the campus to, uh, to go in a different direction when needed. And I think that makes, makes those of us who work here feel happier and more fulfilled in, in being here. 
you know, if we know that we're contributing to, to a, 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 better, a better educational experience for students. I love it. Maybe I should change this to channel our curiosity. Thanks, Ernesto. I really appreciated uh, your man after my own heart of asking great questions. We've